Hi, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, my name is Chumi. I make videos every week to add value to you along with myself. And today especially, welcome to a brand new episode of Monthly Favorites. I have three items that I want to talk to you about. A book, a TV show, and a food item. The book that I want to talk about is The 4-Hour Workweek. This is probably the most famous book ever. I've seen so many people talk about it. I've seen so many people rave about this book especially. So I got my hands on this, I think, at the beginning of the year, but I never really had a chance to read it. It's not that I don't read or I don't like to read, but for some reason, I was just busy at that point and I never really started. Now, with this book, I'd be lying through my teeth if I told you that I started this in July. I actually started this sometime in March. It was one of my books that I wanted to read when lockdown first started. It was in that pile of books that I had. I finally finished it. I finished this on the 31st of July. So, it's still included in July favorites. I wanted to share some of my thoughts in this book. There are a lot of reviews about it. People have spoken about it, so if you want different kind of reviews and perspective, you can go online and search for it. But my view, or rather my opinion on this book, is probably going to be a little bit controversial. First and foremost, the first thing that Tim Ferriss actually recommends you doing is use your work hour to build up your own personal side hustle your own personal business or side business, which I found rather unethical. Um, I tried reading and rereading it a few times and I thought, okay, I probably understood it in a different way. I didn't. That's what he was suggesting. Work from home so that you can use that extra time to do something else also. When you're in the office, you can't do your own personal work. You're talking to other people, you're chatting and catching up, or you're probably just doing work. If you finish your allocated task or your project for that time or that week or maybe even that day, you've got extra time, you then need to start um, something else. You know, you need to pick up something else and do it at work. It's not like he's trying to get you fired at all. It's just that he's trying to teach you to use your time more efficiently. And that's one of the good things that I like about this book. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But what I find about, you know, working from home and using the extra time to do something else, I just find that it touches me somewhere, you know, in that sentiment, uh, work ethic sort of a thing. And I'm like, can't do that. I'll be so guilty. If I finish all of my work before the allocated time or within the week or you know within the deadline, I will then go on and find something else to do. That's what I will always do. All of my personal work will only start after four or five after I finish that work time. I set my lifestyle in that way and that's how I've always done it. So that's out the window for me. Um, working from home doesn't necessarily help me do my own personal stuff. However, some of the other things that he pointed out, I've applied it at work and I thought it was excellent. The one thing that really stood out to me is, just because something is effective doesn't mean it's efficient. And just because you spend so much time on something doesn't mean it's important. And doing something unimportant well doesn't make it important. That stood out to me for a very, very, very long time. I used to be under the impression that because something took me a very long time to do, it's extremely important and I need to stay focused on it and I need to pay attention to it. It's some of the data and things that I've done before. But then I realized it's taking me that long because I've not found an efficient way to do it. I've just been wasting time. I've been beating around the bush and running around in circles trying to figure it out. The minute I realized that, I changed things around with my project and it made so much more sense and it saved me a lot more time. I've applied this to work and to my personal things also and it made so much of a difference to me. I'm usually a bit of an OCD. Okay, I admit, I am a lot of an OCD when it comes to cleaning. I must have certain things done. Before I can sit and study or do my own work, I need to have the kitchen clean. I need to have everything in its own dedicated places. I cannot tolerate a mess or dust. So I spend a lot of time cleaning and putting things away. In the end, by the time I finish all of those things, I'm tired and I cannot pay attention to my studies or I cannot pay attention to my other personal things that I want to do. And then I figured it's not important. Just because it takes a lot more time doesn't make it important. And I cannot say that it is important because I've done it so well. So when I prioritize things that way, I've been more productive than I was before. Another thing that Tim Ferriss spoke about, which is consistent throughout the book, is the 80-20 rule. It's the Pareto's law. 20% um, of your effort yields 80% of your results. 20% of your action yields 80% of the consequences. 20% of your plantation yields 80% of your crops. That's what he means. So if you take your emails, for example, 
you know, let's say you have about 10 emails a day. Not all of your 10 emails are important and not all of your 10 emails are beneficial. Probably only two or three emails from there is something that will yield the results for you. You know, not everything. My own email, for example, I don't get that many emails, but not everything is actually worth your time at all. So the mistake that I do is I keep refreshing my email every hour, every half an hour, especially when I'm looking forward to something. And I notice that I spend a lot of time. I probably spend two, three minutes, an hour looking for email. You then waste a lot of time collectively in the end. So what he advises you to do is eliminate the rest of your work. Let's say you have 10 jobs that day, 10 things in your list. Eliminate eight of it or maybe even seven of it and you should only have two or three things in your list that you have to do that day and then you can complete that. So his idea or his intention is that focusing on the 20% of the work is the one that is going to give you 80% of your results. It does make sense in a way and it is acceptable also. It is applicable for a lot of things that we normally do. A lot of things that he has recommended may not be applicable to us all the same way but you can actually tweak it and make it work for you. If you read the book, you will understand everything. It took me quite a bit of time to actually understand it. Initially, when I first started reading it, it wasn't really reaching out to me. It wasn't really talking to me at all. That's probably why I was a bit slow with the book initially. And then I got the hang of it. And then I thought, yeah, it's actually making more sense now, you know? And then I continued reading it. Some of the parts I read and reread, some of the parts are just not practical. Another thing I want to point out, just because the book says four hour work week, doesn't mean you'll only be working for four hours each week for the rest of your life. You'll be working way, way, way more than that. His biggest tip is for you to identify your wastage, eliminate it, and include more people to assist you and help you so that you use your time in making more important decisions. Once you've identified and eliminated your wastage, he then recommends that you automate your processes. That's where your virtual assistants and other people will come in to support you with your work. So if you can give some of your, um, if you can give the 80% of the work to other people, you can then focus on the 20%, which is important. You can then make important decisions, which will then yield 80% of the results, if that makes any sense. Another thing that stood out to me is where he quoted Steve Jobs in one of his chapters. Um, it's a question that Steve Jobs asks himself. Would I be happy doing whatever I'm about to do today if this were to be the last day of my life? Whenever the reason is no, far too often than expected, it means that it's time to change. Ask yourself this, are you happy doing what you're doing every single day? Your work, your personal life, your personal development and growth, everything that you're doing, does that give you joy? Does it spark joy like Marie Kondo would say? Or does it give you that satisfaction that you're achieving something? Does it give you that drive? Does it give you that motivation to wake up every morning to do what you do? This book is definitely an eye-opener. It may not be practical for us now. It's not possible for you to work only four hours a week and to earn a lot of money straight away. You need to put in a lot of effort and time. But to start off with is going to be difficult. But to cope up and continue in the end, is going to be so worth it. Ultimately, it was worth that three or four months that it took for me to read this book. If there's only one thing that I remember from this book, is this. Just because you spend a lot of time on one thing doesn't make it important. And just because you do something really well, doesn't make it important. Also, just because something is effective, doesn't necessarily mean it is efficient. The next one I want to talk about is a TV show. This one is none other than the Indian matchmaking show. Um, it's on Netflix. Now, I have a bit of a disclaimer. I love binge watching. I have no self-control when it comes to binge watching. Because of that, we don't sign up for a lot of things. And I'm the kind of person who doesn't watch TV Monday to Friday. Monday to Friday is only work, personal development, studies and other things and everything. Saturday and Sunday is the only time we watch movie. It used to be that Friday night, we, um, Friday night is our movie night. So that's what we used to do. Last weekend was a complete opposite. All I did was binge watch the Indian matchmaking. I was so curious because everyone everywhere were talking about Indian matchmaking. I was so tempted and I thought, okay, let's just do this. I was watching the first one and then um, I told myself that I'll just watch one or two and then come back to it like once a week or once in a few days. I don't have to watch everything at a go. Did it work? No. 
<laughs> I finished it within two days. Indian matchmaking was so interesting. It was actually funny. When I sat to watch it, Lakshman actually didn't want to watch it with me. We had an argument because he wanted to watch something else and I wanted to watch this. But then he agreed eventually and we saw that. But he ended up enjoying it along with me. Despite um, a lot of comments saying this is ridiculous, this is rubbish, why do people do this and that and everything. I thoroughly enjoyed it because I knew that that was a fact. It may be a show, people were probably putting up a show but that's real people and that's a reality of Indian matchmaking. It actually, actually happens like that. It's really odd for the locals here. Yeah, it's really odd when some of my friends talk about Indian matchmaking and they're like, how can you ever have an arranged marriage? How can you have a third person introduce you to someone and you know, get to know them and get married to them? It's just not practically possible. You know, especially the criteria that the mothers have must be five foot three, must be fair must be working or mustn't be working, must take care of children, do housework. One of them said, I can't stand comic. Another one said, I need a stable person. A lot of criteria everywhere. And that's a main thing about an Indian matchmaking, criteria, and that those are people's expectations. It is actually an eye-opening show. I would definitely recommend you to watch it. If you've got Netflix, you have to watch it. It's fun. And that's a reality of some people's life. It may not be something that you are used to or you've never seen that before, but that's how life is for a lot of people in the world. I wrote a blog about it and I spoke a lot more in detail about this because I just found it really, really interesting that someone would want to make a show out of it and put it on Netflix and it's doing extremely well. This is probably the first reality show that I actually enjoy watching. I don't really watch any other reality shows. In fact, I've never seen any reality shows. I've never been interested in it because it's not reality. People fake it just because there is a camera around them um, and they have scripts that they have to follow and everything. But this, even though they had scripts, even though some of it was staged, it is the actual reality of a lot of people's lives in India or with Indian ancestral background. This show had so many emotions in it. Some of it was cringy, some of it was really awkward, some of it was really sad and emotional. But some was like, I was rooting for some of them, you know, I thought, oh, that guy is such a sweet guy, he deserves someone better. Or she's like extremely stubborn, she needs to mellow down. And you can see the changes in each one's attitude and character throughout the series as well. We ended up guessing, you know, we ended up trying to figure out who is going to end up with who. And I felt so discontent that it ended up so abruptly. You don't know whether it made it or not, whether the couple that was match made made it or not whether it worked out between them or not. But there's this other thing on YouTube, uh, Netflix India. I don't know what it's called, but I found it yesterday and I saw it. There's this interview with all of the cast and all of the members from Indian Matchmaking, all of them who were part of it. And they explained um, how things worked out for them or not. It didn't work out for any of them. None of the couples who were matched with each other worked anything out between them. They're still friends, they're still chatting and talking, but they still haven't found their partners and, you know, the one. Which makes it um, all the more difficult to trust an arranged marriage. But it works. Arranged marriages work as much as love marriages do and that's all I can say. It's a 50-50 thing but that's a whole entirely different debate altogether. Other than that, this is a reality show which is interesting and it's real life, real people, real family, real emotions, attitude, characters, everything. And it was really nice to see. The next favorite thing that I want to talk about that I've been enjoying throughout the month of July is a food item and it is this. It's a uh, tapioca pearls. Um, I would still consider this a food. It's not your main meal and that isn't enough nutrition in there at all. However, it is so good. I was addicted to bubble tea from Malaysia. Um, I used to have that very, very regularly in Malaysia ever since I moved to UK. It was extremely difficult to find it. So I kind of forgot about it for a few years, except when I go to Malaysia, I always have it when I'm there. And then I found one or two shops that did bubble tea extremely expensive but yet I still treat myself once in a while when we go out to town we don't go really often but when we do definitely bubble tea will be in the list I missed it so much 
So I attempted to do the bobas at home. The bobas are the pearls, which is this, you know, these pearls. These are tapioca pearls, tapioca balls. It's done with tapioca flour. I didn't have tapioca flour at home and I wanted to do it. And it was the peak of lockdown, I think, and I couldn't find tapioca flour anywhere else. But then I found the recipe that said that I could use rice flour instead of tapioca flour. So I used rice flour because I had that at home. It was tedious. It took such a long time to do it. But it was really nice. It was bubble tea. It was boba tea in the end. I got so tired of doing that. I didn't want to do that again because it was so time consuming. I went searching for it and guess where I found it? No prizes for guessing. It was on Amazon. It's a 1kg pack and it only costs 7 dollars to 8 pounds. Probably if the price is high, it may be 9 or 10 pounds and that's all it is. With 1kg, imagine how much you can do. One cup of bubble tea costs about five to six pounds, you know, with the pearls and a regular drink and probably if you add a few other toppings and stuff, it's five or six pounds. And the basic is maybe 350 or four pounds. That's what it is. Imagine how expensive it will be if you keep ordering it out like that. I refuse to order bubble tea from Uber Eats and from Just Eats and any other shop because it was so expensive. You can even have like a bubble tea party next time if you have like a spring or summer party. You can order bubble tea and make it at home and it's easy. Really easy to do it. All you need to do is boil it for two to three minutes until it's floating and then simmer it for another two to three minutes. Turn off the heat and keep the lid closed and then leave it for two to three minutes and then you're done. Probably takes about 10 to 15 minutes and then you cool it in cold water, ice cold water and you add sugar or honey or maple syrup or whatever sweetening thing that you want to add to it. And then you add it onto your drink and that's it. But other than that, it's also important to read instructions. There are instructions right behind here and it does say in one section, please eat tapioca within four hours after cooking. Because I like bubble tea so much, I wanted to have it for a few days in a row. And I didn't want to keep boiling it every day. I didn't want to wait for like, you know, 10, 15 minutes boiling it and then putting it in a cold water and adding on sugar and stuff. So I prepared it for two to three days ahead of time. It was horrible the next day. It was lousy, it hardened up so much and it was so hard. You can't eat it, I had to throw it out in the end. I mean, I still had more than half of it because I didn't have the heart to throw it away. That was the first thing that I trialed out. I made the entire drink ready, put it in the fridge and then took it out for the next day, but it wasn't nice at all. So the second thing that I trialed was made the boba the bubbles separately and then add sugar to it and kept it in a mason jar separately. It was the same with trial too. Regardless of whether it's in liquid in the juice or not, it still hardened up. That's probably why they say you have to consume it within four hours. So one tip of advice for you, if you buy the step your couples to do it at home, do it and consume it immediately or only boil the amount that you need for that day. Don't save it for the next day. Just boil a fresh batch. For the next day otherwise you're gonna throw everything and you're gonna waste everything those were my favorites that i've been enjoying throughout the month of july it's the kind of things that you can do at home to cheer yourself up and to make things interesting for you if you have enjoyed any of my recommendations or if you also think like me for indie matchmaking or the book or even tapioca whatever it is share with me let me know follow me on instagram leave a comment for me here on youtube and please subscribe i would like to see you again here next week when i come back with another video to encourage you and motivate you and to share a little bit of my life with you so take care stay safe have fun with whatever it is that you're doing and i'll see you again next week bye